Good afternoon, all, and welcome to today's webinar with NLP Financial Management and Birchwood Investment Management, members of the NLP FM group. My name is Michael Antonio, and I'll be the host for this call. I hope all of you are staying safe and healthy, and we appreciate you taking the time today to listen in. Before we begin, I would just like to point out that the session is being recorded and a replay and the presentation will be made available at a later point in time. The purpose of today's session is to hear an update from our speakers on the impact of the pandemic on the economy and financial markets, the opportunities in sustainable investing and how we've positioned our mate portfolios at this time. The views expressed here today should not be taken as financial advice, so please speak to your financial planner before taking any action as a result of the presentation. Before I pass over to the speakers, I have some housekeeping to make you aware of. We expect the session to last no more than 40 minutes, with 10 to 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A. All of those dialing in will be muted for the duration of the call, so if you have a question, please send it to us via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We cannot promise that we will have time to answer your questions today, so please speak to your advisor if we do not get the chance to address your query. Later on in this call, we'll be hearing from Charlie McCann, one of our investment analysts, before giving you the opportunity to pose your questions to the presenters and our chief investment analyst, Jacob Schmidt. But firstly, I'm delighted to pass over to Elliot Gotthold, Chartered Financial Plan at NLP Financial Management. Thank you, Michael, and a very warm welcome, everyone, to this afternoon's webinar. It's great to see so many clients of both NLPFM and Birchwood for what is our first jointly held webinar across both companies, and we really do appreciate you giving up your time. So as an introduction, I'm Elliot Gotthold, a Chartered Financial Planner, and I've been with NLP Financial Management for 10 years. I'm a member of our investment committee and have an input, therefore, into our investment strategy and the portfolios that we manage. For the first part of the presentation, I'll give a brief macroeconomic update, outline our thoughts on markets, and summarize our key investment themes for the year ahead. I must stress that I'm speaking on behalf of the investment committee, and I'm delighted that Jacob Schmidt, our chief investment analyst, will be on the call later for questions. For the second part of the presentation, I'll hand over to Charlie to speak about investment opportunities in sustainability, an increasingly popular investment theme, and I'm sure you'll find his talk enlightening. So I'll start with a very brief update on coronavirus. And you can see here the upward trend as we move through the second wave, most notably in Europe, the purple line, and North America and the gray line. The top chart shows how the number of cases are much higher now than in spring. Although of course, there's far more testing being done. And in Europe, the cases have been increasing exponentially, hence the current lockdowns we're going through in many countries. Clearly, the longer the restrictions remain in place, the bigger the impact on the economy, with rising unemployment and businesses failing being the main concerns. And we saw yesterday that unemployment in the UK has risen to 4.8%, up from 3.9% at the start of the year. The bottom chart shows that the death count is considerably lower than in spring, although sadly on the increase in Europe. We can also see from the chart that the virus in Asia is far more under control, and we're seeing positive economic data there with stock markets on the rise. Finally, Latin America remains a cause for concern, with both cases and deaths still at elevated levels, albeit on the decline. So in terms of global growth, and the chart on the left-hand side looks at real GDP growth in developed markets since 2006, and shows the scale of the economic fallout from the pandemic. This year, we've seen sharp declines in economic growth, even worse than during the global financial crisis of 2008, but hardly surprising given that economic activity almost ground to a halt. The light blue line shows the UK faring considerably worse than other developed markets. However, we can see from the dots that the consensus forecast is for a return to positive growth next year, almost a classic V-shaped recovery, if you like. And certainly the news this week regarding the vaccine would support these forecasts and has led to a rally in stock markets. But we do feel that the longer risks of a longer economic slowdown have not totally diminished either. And we're mindful of the fact that forecasts do not always pan out as expected. Just this week, we've seen poor economic data in Germany, raising concerns of a double dip recession there. And of course, Germany is the powerhouse of the European economy, so we're monitoring this closely. The right hand chart shows the contributions different regions have made to global growth since 1985. And of particular interest here is the growing impact China has had towards global growth, as indicated by the bar at the bottom, by the bottom segment of each bar. And I'll speak more about China later on. 
So in terms of stock markets, this chart just shows how quickly the US market has recovered the heavy losses earlier this year. The orange line on the left hand side show the house, shows how the S&P 500 fell by 35% in a very short space of time, but within six months it had fully recovered, making this by far the fastest sell off and recovery the market's ever experienced. In contrast, after the global financial crisis of 2007-2008, it took nearly four years for the market to return to its pre-crisis level. And with a strong rally that we've seen over the past week, the S&P 500 is now up by around 9% year to date and trading close to all time highs. So with this, while this has taken many market commentators by surprise, there are some important factors to consider here. The recovery has been driven by a small number of mega cap stocks, often referred to by the acronym FANGS, the likes of Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. Microsoft can also be included here, along with other technology stocks, which have seen strong share price growth, and this has perhaps distorted the market. Many companies in the market in this S&P 500 have struggled and continue to struggle as the impacts of coronavirus unwind. So perhaps the rapid, re rapid recovery is not a true indication of the underlying state of the economy. And we're watching this very closely as the US remains a driver of global growth and forms an important part of our portfolios. This next slide just looks at forward earnings estimates of various markets and the market returns in the main developed markets this year. On the left hand side, we can see that earnings estimates of US growth stocks have returned to similar levels as before the crash, whereas the UK earnings estimates remain down by about 30% and are still subdued, with similar trends in Europe and Japan. On the right hand side, we can see how the UK has fared fared considerably worse than other developed markets in terms of returns, and US growth stocks have not only recovered, but are up by over 20%. So what we're seeing here is significant dispersions, not only between different markets, but between earnings and stock market performance, and between growth and value stocks. And this indicates that some stocks and sectors may now be expensive, but on the other hand, others look very cheap and are therefore attractive investment opportunities in the medium to long term. So with all the disruption caused by the pandemic, vast amounts of monetary and fiscal stimulus have been used to support economies. I appreciate there's a lot of information here, and if you want copies of the slides afterwards, please speak to your usual NLPFM or Birchwood contact. This table just looks at how unconventional monetary policies have evolved in recent years. And monetary policy refers to measures taken by central banks, so the Bank of England, the Fed, the European Central Bank, to provide liquidity to markets and support economies. During the global financial crisis, the Fed used a variety of emergency measures to provide liquidity and to stabilise markets, most notably when Lehman Brothers collapsed and money markets were brink of, on the brink of failure in September 2008. The main tool used has been quantitative easing, whereby central banks inject money into the economy by purchasing government bonds or other financial assets. The Fed began this on a huge scale in 2008, and the ECB started to buy European sovereign debt in July 2012. And since then, other unconventional measures have been taken, such as negative interest rates, negative yields on government bonds, and in extreme cases, talk of helicopter money, where money is literally printed by central banks and distributed to the public. In March of this year, the Fed, ECB and Bank of Japan were pumping money into the economy on an enormous scale, at one point buying 1.5 billion US dollars of assets every hour. And the balance sheets of central banks are now at vast levels, around about 23 trillion US dollars. And we've also seen extraordinary fiscal measures being taken. So um, what we can see here are the two options available to the Treasury in response to a crisis. Firstly, money can be given to businesses and people in the form of grants and loans, as indicated by the purple bars. And then there's also the opportunity to lower taxes, as demonstrated by the grey bars. And while the latter has not been used to a great extent, with the exception perhaps of the US, the former has been widely used, as we can clearly see here. We can see here the extent to which treasuries have supported individuals and companies, most notably perhaps in Germany and Italy. In some cases, huge equity injections have been made to support businesses, such as Lufthansa in Germany, which was bailed out to the tune of 9.8 billion US dollars in May. Here in the UK, fiscal stimulus through the fur furlough scheme and loans to small businesses represented almost 17% of nominal GDP at the end of September. And this is showing no signs of slowing. 
with the news last week that the furlough scheme is being extended until March and another 150 billion of support promised by the Bank of England. So really in summary here, we've seen massive monetary and fiscal support for markets. And as long as this continues, it supports not only the economies, but the stock markets. And just very briefly, and this is one of my favorite charts that I like to show clients to show the importance of staying invested and to avoid being too concerned about short-term volatility, such as the volatility we've seen this year. Because if we look back at the annual returns of the FTSE All Share Index, as indicated by the gray bars, they fluctuate significantly from year to year, but more often than not, they're positive. While the lowest point in any calendar year, as measured by the uh, red dots, is usually much lower. So if we take 2009 as an example, at one point the market was down 23%, and yet by the end of the year, it was up 25%. The key message here is that for long-term investors, it's important to see through any short-term volatility. History shows that it, market timing is very difficult, and despite the current challenges, we encourage investors not to panic and to remember that markets do recover. So as we approach the end of 2020 and look forward towards next year, hoping for a better year ahead, as portfolio managers, we're always looking to identify the big picture themes, and these form a basis for our asset allocation and fund selection. As we move through the second wave and hopefully through a period of recovery, we have to ask what will be the true economic impacts of the pandemic and how will this continue to affect markets? How much is already priced in? We often hear the term new normal, and this is very true when it comes to businesses. The pandemic may be an extreme and unexpected event, but in the corporate world, there have been winners and losers. At the start of the year, Amazon shares were trading at $19 a share, and today they're over $30, having been as high as $35 in September. For many people, the closure of non-essential shops during lockdown is not such a hardship when everything is available at the single click of at the single click via the Amazon app, with next day or even same day delivery the norm. And Amazon is one of the biggest underlying holdings in our portfolios. We strongly believe that this is a stock pickers market and that active management is key. We're looking to invest in funds that can pick the winners and outperform their benchmarks. And now is not the time, in our opinion, to simply track the indices. Last week's US election was a closely fought affair and the initial reaction to a Biden administration looks positive for stock markets. History shows that a new government in the US often leads to a rally, at least in the short term. So how the political changes pan out and whether Biden can indeed unite and divide a nation is very significant for markets. We're also watching closely to see if a gridlock situation can be avoided, whereby the House is Democrat and the Senate Republican. In this scenario, Biden may struggle to push through as much fiscal stimulus as he'd like, and his scope to make changes would be limited. Trade wars between the US and China have been a headwind to markets for some time, and Biden is seen as more China-friendly than Trump, so we may see an easing of tensions, which again would be supportive for markets. It feels like Brexit has been somewhat on the back burner this year due to the virus, but it's looming on the horizon and uncertainty surrounding trade deals continues to weigh on the UK market and perhaps is one of the reasons why it's been so weak. However, the market is now at very cheap levels and any favourable deals with the EU could lead to a rally, especially for domestic focused stocks. And we're ready to act as the situation unfolds. But for the time being, however, we're maintaining an underweight position to the UK. China looks like being first in and first out of the pandemic with the virus seemingly under control and economic growth continuing at a strong pace. The latest figures show exports up 11.4% year on year and annual GDP growth of 4.9%, despite the slowdown caused by the virus. China has successfully transitioned itself from an export-focused export economy to one that is far more domestically focused, with many huge companies whose fortunes are no longer linked to the state of the global economy. And this provides interesting investment opportunities, both within China and in Asia as a whole. Digitalization has been a theme in the portfolios for several years and is increasing at an ever more rapid pace, providing interesting opportunities as companies seek to take advantage of the changing world. People are spending more time than ever online. Cash is being replaced by digital payments and the e-commerce market is booming an estimated to expand from 1.8 trillion US dollars in 2018 to 2.7 trillion by 2023. The state of the environment and the future of our planet 
along with companies having a strong corporate governance policies, is of growing importance to investors. So it's no surprise that from companies which focus on these areas often perform well. Charlie will provide a lot more detail on this, so I won't steal his thunder. But sustainability is an important theme for all of our portfolios. And finally, we saw that before the growth stocks have significantly outperformed value stocks in recent times. And we have to be wary of the fact that there may well be a re reversal. But we must also remember that some value stocks are cheap for a reason, and it's important to avoid what we call value traps. A classic example, in our opinion, would be UK banks, which are trading at attractive levels from a valuation perspective, but where we feel the outlook is somewhat bleak as more technology-focused challenger banks become available. Now, just a very brief slide to provide an update on the action we've taken in the portfolios that we manage. And many of you will be aware that we de-risked the portfolio significantly earlier this year, reducing exposure to equities and moving into cash and defensive bond funds. Since then, we've started to add back to equities, although we remain underweight relative to our neutral positions. So over the past two months, we've reduced exposure to cash, short dated bonds and money market funds and added to Japanese, Asian and European equities, areas that we feel offer the best value and the best upside potential given market conditions at the moment. We also added this global strategic bond fund, which has been on our watch list for some time and where the fund manager has proved to be astute in repositioning his portfolio as economic conditions have changed. As discretionary fund managers, we're constantly looking for opportunities to add value and to outperform our benchmarks. And our team of analysts have met almost 200 fund managers and brokers via Zoom and team, Teams since the pandemic began. So the final slide from me, and in conclusion, we're very conscious of the myriad of risks out there, especially around coronavirus and how the second wave or more pans out. Will there be more lockdowns? And how long will this all go on for? How quickly can a vaccine be rolled out? And when will things return to normal? And ultimately, what will the political and economic fallout be from all of this? I highlighted before the importance of unconventional monetary and fiscal policy. And whilst this support to the economy and stock market seems unwavering, we have to ask for how long can it continue and at what price in the long term? But on a positive note, this is not a financial crisis. The system is not broken like it was in 2008. And with continued financial stimulus, advances in technology, and hopefully a vaccine, the potential remains for a swift and sustainable economic recovery. Our philosophy is that diversification is key across both asset classes and geographical regions and active management. There will be winners and losers from the pandemic, from Brexit and from the big long-term and global themes taking place. And our job is to identify and invest in the winners and avoid the losers. So finally, on the subject of winners, our sustainability model portfolio has performed extremely well since its inception. And I'm delighted to now hand over to Charlie McCann, the brains behind the portfolio, to speak about investment opportunities in sustainability. Thank you, Elliot. That was uh, very interesting. And uh, thank you for the segue into sustainable investing. Uh, I'm just going to take about 15 minutes of your time today to talk to you about about something which excites us all across the business, and that's sustainable investing. Uh, I'll start off by covering some of the biggest challenges facing us in uh, the environment and society today, and then move on to how investment solutions can be used to meet these challenges head on. I'll then finish by discussing the sustainable portfolio in more detail. And this was something that was launched just over two years ago in July 2018. Um, I would just like to stipulate that um, this is about the sustainable portfolio, but as Elliot alluded to earlier, this is something we're keen on across the company and something where we're looking to implement the best ideas within our core portfolios as well. So I'll talk about the challenges and I'll start with plastics pollution. Um, since the 1950s, when plastics became uh, used by the mainstream, we've produced over 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic. Um, unfortunately, only 9% of these plastics have been recycled to date. Uh, and as a result, a lot of those do end up in landfill sites, or as you could see from the picture in the middle here, a lot does end up in our ocean. Uh, this has been brought to our attention a lot more in recent years, um, 
in some part thanks to David Attenborough amongst other uh, documentary makers. Um, unfortunately, this, unless something is done about this, we do expect this trend to continue. There are already five trillion pieces of plastic uh, that currently live in the ocean, and it is estimated that more plastics will be in the ocean uh, than fish by 2050. So quite a shocking statistic there. Now, if you look at this slide out of context, you may think that I've nicked it from the Tate Modern, uh, but actually it highlights a very real threat to our environment. Um, and this really just shows from 1850 to uh, the end of last year, the average temperatures worldwide. And you can see uh, the acceleration of, of change in the last 20 years in particular, uh, as global warming becomes a very real issue. Uh, brought on by the increase in greenhouse gas emissions. I think it's uh, CO2 emissions are up 40% since the turn of the century. Uh, and we've actually seen the 20 warmest years uh, on record in come all come in the last 22 years. So again, you know, it's becoming a very increasing problem and one that really cannot be ignored no longer. But the increase in consumption that we uh, take part in as a society not only has an impact on the earth that we live in, but it also has a material impact on us ourselves. Uh, back in 1980, uh, diabetes, which is a disease born mostly from obesity, um, was only affecting 100 million adults. If we skip forward 40 years, that's now at 463 million, and it's expected to reach 700 million by 2045. The middle two charts there just would suggest that this is an America-centric problem, but unfortunately that's not the case. Um, we are seeing increasing cases uh, of obesity and diabetes creeping into Asia and more emerging markets as they get extra access to fast food and it becomes an increasing part of their culture. And as a result, there are over 116 million adults in China now with uh, diabetes. Now, this is obviously disappointing to hear, but it does also prevent an uh, present an opportunity for us. As you can see from the right hand side, 10% of global health expenditure is spent on diabetes at the minute. And we feel that this really does present an opportunity for investing in the healthcare sector in particular. So I've got through all the bad news and hopefully it's a little bit more positive from here on. Um, this here is uh, very colourful, but it's from the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which were created in 2015 uh, to address the problem, the biggest problems facing us uh, in society and the environment. And I think I've covered a few of those, but there wouldn't be time to go into all of them in great detail. But the, this provides essentially a, a necessary framework for governments, corporates, and indeed the investment industry when making decisions that can actually prove positive for the environment around us. In addition to this, we've got 197 signatories to the UN Framework for Convention on Climate Change, uh, also known as the Paris Agreement, which uh, limit, it aims to limit the uh, temperature rise to below two degrees Celsius for the century. You may have seen uh, last week that the US withdrew from that formally, but we are expecting that with Joe Biden in the White House, that they would uh, rejoin this soon as they take extra focus on climate change and the environment as a whole. So those are the themes that we really had from a sustainable point of view heading into this year. Obviously, coronavirus has presented many challenges, um, not least from a healthcare perspective. And this is something that you know none of us really could have predicted or, or feared at the start of the year, but it has shone a spotlight on the ingenuity of the healthcare sector. You've probably all seen the, the good news, or at least hopefully good news, from Pfizer a couple of days ago on a potential vaccine that could be uh, with us very shortly. And there are other, other companies as well in the space that are providing uh, very close to achieving some form of vaccine or, or treatment. Digitalization is something that Elliot alluded to earlier, um, and this is a theme, as he said, that has been going on for a number of years. Um, but it is actually uh, something that we think has been not only accelerated by the coronavirus crisis, but also something we expect to stay in the main, uh, main for, for the foreseeable future, as we see more people shifting to working from home, but also interacting with their friends and family from home as well. So talking on the subject of the digital transformation, 
Uh, we've got a quote at the top here from the CEO of Microsoft at the end of April saying that they'd seen two years worth of digital transformation in just two months. Um, everyone working from home using Teams or Zoom uh, that we're using today. But you can see from the left hand side chart that the number of Microsoft Teams users absolutely skyrocketed. It was a figure of about 8 million only two years ago. Uh, and by the end of March, we were looking at over 75 million Microsoft Teams users. Not only that, but the number of meetings per day, as you would expect, also rose, but in a short space of time. So from the 12th of March, we had 560 million meetings per day on Microsoft Teams. By the end of the month, that was at 2.7 billion uh, as we were hitting the peak of the lockdowns from a global point of view. Uh, and I'd just like to say that the Microsoft is actually one of the largest holdings within the sustainability portfolio, and it's a company that we're very keen on across the business. So this the, uh, page here just shows a few examples and all of these uh, companies are held with our underlying fund managers at present. Um, I won't go into too much detail about all of them, but I think it does show that this is a globally diversified portfolio and it does look at some of the biggest companies in the world, some of the global leaders in their space. Companies like Apple and Microsoft, which I mentioned, Nintendo have benefited from people being at home more and using the Switch console. MasterCard uh, has benefited from a move to online payments as we shift away from cash as a society. On the left hand side of the digitalization theme, perhaps a name lesser known with some of you, uh, TSMC is actually the world's largest producer of semiconductors and they produce all of the chips for all of Apple's products. Now, digitalization flows quite nicely into the environment and we think that it actually plays a vital part in, the, in our ability to clean up the environment that we live in. Companies such as Tomra, which is the world leader in plastics uh, recycling with their reverse vending machine technology, Xylem, the uh, water waste reduction fund, and Allstead in the middle there, which actually transitioned completely from an oil and gas company only 15 years ago to becoming the world leader in offshore wind. And Orsted recently was voted as the world's most sustainable company. So uh, it can it just goes to show what can be achieved when you put your mind to it. And in terms of the fight against coronavirus, we know obviously AstraZeneca are one of the front runners at producing a vaccine, Unilever from a hygiene point of view. And then some of the lesser known names, perhaps in the middle there, Thermo Fisher actually produce over 50% of the tests for coronavirus worldwide. Diasaurin also produce a test that actually gives you a result in under 35 minutes. So these are companies that are really leading the space uh, from not only the healthcare, but also from the fight against coronavirus, which is obviously very important to us today. So what exactly is sustainable investing? I think it means many different things to many different people and none of those people are necessarily incorrect. There is no industry standard when we look at sustainable investing, um, but it is slightly different from what a lot of people perhaps perceive it to be. It has moved on from the days of the exclusions based or ethical investing that you would have seen in the past, whereby you would simply buy the index, um, but take out the tobacco and oil companies. Um, there are some myths about, you know, it harming your risk or return profile. We actually think that it can enhance it and I'll explain that a little bit more later on. But obviously for us investing, no matter whether it's sustainable or whatever theme you're talking about, it has to be about returns first. This isn't philanthropy uh, and we expect it to actually give you a better return longer term. Um, if we talk about the individual components that I've got here on this slide, Sustainable innovation is something that I've alluded to in previous slides, but we are looking at companies that lead the space and provide disruptive technologies that can provide the solutions to the sustainable challenges that I, I mentioned earlier. Quality fundamentals refers to the sustainability of the business model of a lot of these companies. We're looking for companies with strong balance sheets, perhaps net cash even, with the ability to invest in research and development going forwards. We're looking for companies with a strong ESG ethos. And ESG stands for Environment, Society and Governance. We want companies that have a strong shareholder and stakeholder alignment and are doing the very best for their staff and the people in the environment that they operate. 
And in terms of secular trends, we think that a lot of sustainable companies are actually in the parts of the market that we feel have got the best long term secular growth opportunities behind them and a lot of tailwinds going forward. We think that sustainable investing provides a certain resilience that you may not get from just investing alone in the main part of the market. If we focus on the left-hand side of the uh, this uh, left-hand side of this chart, you can see the percentage of sustainable indices that have outperformed their traditional market comparators during the biggest downturns that we've seen in recent years. I won't go into too many of them too much detail, but the bottom left just shows how much better a lot of these sustainable indices performed during the uh, big sell-off that we saw in the first quarter of this year. But it's not just a resilience of performance. We've seen it in terms of investor appetite as well this year. If we look at the right-hand side, the level of flows into sustainable investing has continued to grow. And in a period such as the first quarter of this year, when investors were panicking and actually looking to liquidate their assets in most spaces, sustainable investing still saw money going into it. Uh, for example, in the first quarter, we saw 45 billion go into sustainable investing at a time where other funds actually saw 384 billion come out. So I'll spend the next few slides to talk a little bit more about the sustainability portfolio that we've got at the business. This is something that we've uh, been looking at for a number of years now and actually launched uh, about two, two and a half years ago. Um, it's a highly, highly diversified uh, portfolio across all asset classes and geographies. We aim for a close alignment to the uh, traditional balanced model that some of you may already be invested in. Um, and it really does closely uh, replicate that from a geographical perspective to match the views of us uh, and the investment committee. We have benefited uh, from overweights to certain areas of the market that have had tailwinds behind them this year, such as uh, healthcare and technology, which I've mentioned before. Um, we benefited from not having any exposure to oil and gas, as you would expect in a portfolio of this nature, it wouldn't hold a company that uh, operates in any form of unsustainable nature and oil and gas is one of the big no-nos there. And we do think that we have an underweight to the more old economy and perhaps more value focused stocks such as banks uh, and tobacco and, and alcohol stocks, which, which uh, would not form part of the portfolio either. Now, while sustainability as a theme is perhaps a little bit new to some of you, it is something that's been going on for a long time now and has really grown uh, to be quite a mature part of the market. At NLP and Birchwood, we always look for the very best fund managers with the longest track records and abilities to generate those excess returns. And for example, this portfolio uh, has an average manager tenure of over 10 years and an average fund size of 900 million, which is not small by any stretch of the imagination. So how does that equate to performance? Well, so far, so good, I think. Uh, the green line here just represents the sustainability portfolio since its inception in July of 2018. Uh, this figure is before uh, fees and taxes, I should add, but it's still been able to generate about 12 to 12.5% in a period which has seen the UK market fall by over 23%. And the two uh, sectors we compare it to, the mixed investment sectors, uh, both uh, have only generated about 2 to 3% return. So significant outperformance in the longer term. More recently, year to date, this portfolio is up about 2%, whereas the UK market again has really lagged and is down 25%. And the two mixed investment sectors are down 3 and 4% apiece. This chart just really looks at it from a more granular month by month perspective, but it shows the same thing. And I think for me, the, the, the most important thing uh, on this chart is really what we can see in February and March. You know, we speak of our safe hands approach at NLP and Birchwood, and we've always had a focus on downside capital preservation. And this portfolio has been able to do exactly what we would have wanted it to. So in February and March, which was the peak of the, uh, the lockdowns, but also the market sell off, this portfolio, again, represented by the green bars, was able to hold up far better than the UK market and the mixed sectors on the way down. But what's been equally impressive for us is its ability to keep up with the market and, and the sectors on the way up in the recovery. So 
April and May were you know good months, as was June. And we've seen more recently as uh, volatility crept back into the market in September and October, this portfolio again was able to display the resilient characteristics that we would hope it would. And you can see from the right hand side, um, something that we're always keen on doing is achieving as big of an asymmetry of returns as possible versus the UK market. We've been able to keep up as much as possible on the upside whilst limiting the downside exposure uh, as much as we possibly could. And I think we're very happy with what it's been able to do so far. So I'll just conclude uh, on the sustainability portfolio, but also as a theme for all of the portfolios that we have across the business. Um, it's something that we're very keen on. We do believe that this is a great opportunity for investors to fund positive change but also enhance and diversify in terms of a risk return perspective. And it is always, as always, in keeping with our safe hands approach. And I think that's all. So I'll pass back to Michael for the Q&A. Thank you, Charlie. Um, we have received a number of questions from email sent in and via the Q&A button throughout the call. So thank you everyone for all your questions so far. Uh, please do continue to send them through and we will try to answer as many as time permits. Um, okay, I think the first question we've got here is for Jacob. Uh, how do you see financial markets performing post the election results for the rest of the year? And are we likely to see a rally over the Christmas period? Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, good evening, everyone on this call. Um, I think there were three stumbling blocks before the election in the last few days. One, obviously, the US election. I think we can almost tick it off. I think uh, some kind of solution out of that. New president split house, as we know. It might even then become a, a, a blue sweep in the end. We have to wait for the election outcome in Georgia. But that looks very positive in this certainly a positive development. The second one, obviously, the search for the vaccine. Uh, positive news this week, as we all know, we all clued to the screens. That is very positive news, even though it's still early days, and we have to be very careful that we're not getting carried away. And the third one, the third stumbling block still is the deal for the UK, Brexit. Um, that is still uh, waiting for a solution. Most people are slightly somewhat positive that there is going to be some kind of deal, but this is still some kind of a sword hanging over us. But in general, much more positivity. Uh, and as uh, Elliot um, explained uh, very, very eloquently, the, the, the monetary policy and the fiscal support that we've seen this year uh, has been unprecedented and will continue to be here. Perhaps not as generous as in the first part of this Crisis, but it will continue to be here. So I think there is uh, stock markets are still relatively cheap. Some of the sectors have rallied, but uh, many stocks that have rallied in the last two days, when we've seen a sector rotation out of the uh, growth stocks into some of the value stocks, value stocks still as hugely undervalued or let's say cheap, not necessarily undervalued. That's, a, that's another discussion. So I think there's more to go. And we think we can see here some kind of Christmas rally. We continue. Obviously, we've seen a lot in the last two, three days, but uh, we are positive, uh, um, but measuredly positive. Thank you, Jacob. Um, so I've had a couple questions come through here on the COVID-19 vaccine, perhaps one for Jacob. Uh, what is the impact of the announcement on a COVID-19 vaccine? When I said um, we are all waiting for more news, more details about uh, obviously BioNTech, this, which came out yesterday, uh, and some other news of other vaccine out there. I understand there are uh, 11 or 12 vaccines at the moment in a, in a phase three trial, which is very good. As we learned today from the chief UK chief scientist, uh, science officer that, um, uh, that there is now a very accelerated way of going through these still very sound trials and tests, phase one, two, three. Uh, so there's good news out there, uh, uh, but as said, I think it would take much longer. And I think there are some issues. One of the issues, obviously, uh, the storage of that. We need, as you know, we need a lot of uh, uh, cool, uh, uh, um, temperature is a, an issue, and then the production is an issue. So it's good news, 
but perhaps the markets are too excited about that. But certainly, I think we are closer to the end than to the beginning. Great, thank you, Jacob. Um, um, I think Elliot mentioned earlier in the presentation um, that the winners and losers, um, there'll be winners and losers as a result of Brexit. What are the anticipated winners? <laughs> Jacob, do you want to take this one or, or shall I? It's... I can take a little bit and then you come in. Yes. Um, I think um, without showing my cards, what I think about Brexit, but you can uh, you can think about my last name. So, uh, um, but, but I think in terms of Brexit, there's going to be obviously uh, any deal is better than no deal. And, uh, and a deal is, would help many sectors. I think as we as we learned today from Elliot and, and then from Charlie, that there are certain sectors, and these are the newer economies. These are the, the FinTech, this is the wealth tech, this is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the more agile sectors. Uh, we can call them also the COVID-19 stocks, the Netflixes and so on. They will continue to be rather the winners, not just out of COVID-19, but also in a new, in this new normal and so on. So, so I would think that in the UK, those sectors and those stocks that are rather exposed to these sectors and have, uh, have uh, business models that can adapt and can cater for this, they will be the winners. I think the old economy, among them, for example, the banks, uh, will continue to be the losers. Yes, we've seen very nice rallies in the banks in the last few days, but they're still significantly below the levels for the crisis and obviously before, uh, from uh, many years ago. Um, and there are new contenders. Then, as you know, many other uh, 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 smaller banks coming in, fintechs in. And so the banks, for example, is one sector that are going to be losers. But then the winners are the fintechs and, and uh, financial, uh, uh, quasi-financial companies and so on. And you can play this in many other sectors. You can say that insurance, you can say that in many other sectors, we're going to see that. So. Uh, but probably in the UK, because we are heavier towards value stocks than growth stocks, perhaps more difficult. And there's one of the reasons why the FTSE has lagged behind other indices such as the S&P 500. Uh, Elliot or uh, Charlie, you want to add anything on that? I think it's obviously also an ESG sustainability uh, uh, topic in a way that sustainability, sustainable companies and ESG companies are much more agile, are much more uh, uh, um, cater for, these, for the new world order, which is out of Europe and so on. We don't have so many here, but then we might get them and they might join the FTSE and so on. So I think we are positive. Oh, and I'll just sort of echo that and add that sort of from the broader market and valuation perspective, you know, as we saw before, the UK does look cheap and and it has been held back because of all the uncertainty with Brexit. Now, we still don't know what any trade deal will, will look like. But as Jacob said, you know, if there is any kind of favourable deal, then, then we could be looking at a rally just purely on the fact that we've been held back so much. And... Um, domestic focus stocks, small and mid cap stocks, they, these have tended to rally on any kind of positive news on Brexit. So we've seen, you know, whenever there's positive news flow about a possible deal, there tends to be a jump up there. So, so we're watching it closely and we think there could be, be some opportunities, but, but clearly there's still plenty of pain out there as well. And, you know, it's a, a lot of uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have a question for Charlie here. Um, what is the impact of Biden's victory on sustainability? Yeah, it's uh, an interesting one. And, and obviously, Jacob mentioned earlier, we still aren't aware of what the result is going to be with the Senate. And that could really uh, make quite a, a vast difference in terms of the level of policy that we will see uh, from a Joe Biden administration. I do think that, you know, as I mentioned earlier in my slides, that 
uh, we would expect him to push for the US to, to become a signatory again for the, the UN framework for Convention on Climate Change, which, you know, is definitely a, a positive step in the right direction. We've heard a lot in his, um, in a lot of his speeches in the past that there is a certain rhetoric that focuses on uh, green spending and spending on green infrastructure. As I say, it does depend on whether the Democrats get the, uh, the Senate on how much they will be able to actually spend. But certainly there is the aim from the Democrats and Joe Biden that a lot of the spending will be focused on uh, green infrastructure and you know, preventing any worsening of the climate change situation. Okay. Uh, we've got another question here. Uh, General Sir Nick Carter said that the global economy crisis caused by the coronavirus pandemic could also trigger new security threats, even a war. What would happen to our investments if all these small conflicts escalate out of control? Okay, I'm happy to take it or not happy. Uh, so uh, I think there are two parts of the question. The first one is the likelihood of war in the second one, um, or a bigger war, God forbid. And the second one would then be, what would the impact be on, the, on our portfolios? Um, I think we've moved on in terms of warfare. Uh, I think we're going to see less and less uh, physical wars and much more uh, economic wars and cyber wars and so on. These are the big threats and hence these companies benefit from that. We cannot rule it out. I think unfortunately conflicts Will continue to be that seems to be unfortunately part of human nature um it, it, we cannot plan for that uh, as said i think the uh, uh, european union is one of these mechanisms to actually prevent it and that's the sad part of that we are leaving the european union with all the criticism that is justified but i think there are security arrangements in place i think the economic interest is too deep for people to uh, to uh, to engage into really physical wars we're going to still have local wars like in the middle east and in other parts unfortunately so uh, so so i would think this is is a is a is a lower probability is a higher probability of economic wars trade wars as we've seen in the last few years under trump in china unfortunately or cyber wars and attacks and that's really i think the issue and that's what we're focusing on and unfortunately not enough companies that you can invest into and to get exposure to the sector will grow in the years to come. How would we be exposed? Uh, of course, you would suffer. If God forbid there was another uh, world war, like World War III, um, it would affect us. But then uh, we are in, you are in, in, in a diversified portfolio and the, device, the diversified portfolio has got bonds in it, it's got uh, alternative investments, it's got a cash level and so on. So, and then it's highly diversified. As we said, for example, Microsoft is the largest holding in our portfolio, but let's not forget, it's less than 1%. So the high diversification in sectors, in geographies, in asset classes and so on, should protect. Uh, and I would be positive in, in that, I think a physical war is less likely, but we could have a threat such as cyber threat and so on. That's why I think that's the really, Put, together with the pandemic, the, the real risk out there at the moment. Next okay. one. Okay, thank you. I think that's that's all, all we have time for today. As I mentioned earlier, if we were unable to answer your question today, or if you have any further queries, please follow up with your usual financial planner or advisor. A recording of this call will be made available at a later date if there's anything you missed today. Thank you very much, Elliot, Charlie, and Jacob for your time. Thanks especially to all of you who have listened in. We, have ho we hope that you found the session useful. And on that note, I'd like to bring today's webinar to a close. We hope you continue to stay safe and we look forward to hearing from you all you again soon. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you. Thanks very much, thank you.